right, good morning, church family. How are we? Good, good, good. Do me a favor, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter eight. Acts chapter eight. Also, let me point out, we have the awesome privilege of taking the Lord's Supper this morning, okay? And so, this is for all born again, baptized believers, okay? If you did not pick one up on your way in, if you would lift your hand, uh, our deacons will come around, okay? If we missed anyone, make sure you have these. Mentally, I want you to, to think the entire service is moving towards the important moment where we take the Lord's Supper together as a church family, okay? All right, so this morning we're gonna pick up our narrative in the book of Acts. And uh, for seven chapters in the book of Acts, we, we saw the church's witness in Jerusalem, there in the temple courtyard. And then a couple weeks ago with Stephen's death, we, we saw an intense persecution break out in Jerusalem and that gospel bubble burst and, and Philip forced to flee, okay, uh, because of the persecution, went to Samaria. Philip is one of those whose world was turned upside down because of Stephen's death, right? He relocated his family. All that he knows is different as he is now in Samaria. And we find him in the capital city, but the Lord uses him Okay? This displacement, it is used specifically because as he went, they preached the gospel. And suddenly you see a widespread response in Samaria, a revival. And Peter and John come down from Jerusalem to check this out, okay? and specifically to pray, and the Spirit falls upon the Samaritans the same way that he did on the Jews at Pentecost. Now, picture the, the scene. Think, right? Be filled with astonishment. Acts 1.8, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria. This is exactly what is taking place. The Samaritans, right? Those half-breeds. Remember what the Assyrians did. All their mixed up false worship. And now the Samaritans are in a large movement of God being saved. Now in our text today, we're going to see, we're going to go from this widespread revival movement down to one individual. A text that many of you are familiar with, the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, as we read it this morning, as we walk through it, this, this text is magnificent. It's magnificent on so many levels. Oh, that God would allow us to read it and to hear it fresh as if we were reading it for the first time. Would you pray to that end? Because this passage is about the defective, the inadequate, being made whole in Jesus, right? And on a spiritual level, that is each and every one of us this morning. Think about that as we move towards the Lord's Supper and how King Jesus and his body and blood make us whole. So listen as I read in our narrative, we're gonna pick up in Acts chapter eight, beginning in verse 25. Uh, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you if you do not have one. Listen as I read. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they, that's going to be Peter and John, started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, 
who had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join his chariot. And so Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and to sit with him. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come and have gathered this morning to worship you, to read your word, to sing your praises, to to pray your truth, Father, would you quicken our minds and our hearts to understand afresh and anew the fact that you knew each of us from eternity past. And you had a divine appointment in our lives where you saw us and you called us to yourself. May that truth wash over us afresh. May it overwhelm us your love and your personal detail to leave the 99 and to pursue the one and that each of us is that one. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. So Peter and John are returning to Jerusalem and they are passing through Samaritan village after village and preaching the gospel. Now remember, this is the same John who in Luke 9 wanted to call down fire from heaven and destroy a Samaritan village that didn't respond well to Jesus. Quite a different scene as they now see thousands being saved. Philip presumably is still in the capital city of Samaria. He is in the middle of one of the greatest movements of God ever. Revival, seeing thousands come to faith. This is Pentecost 2.0. Philip has come a long way from distributing food to disgruntled widows. Now, what faithfulness means is discipling new believers, organizing new churches, and raising up leaders. When suddenly an angel calls him away from it all, on a sizable journey to a desert road south of Jerusalem. And frankly, in the middle of nowhere, okay? Look at this map. You can, you can see that, that they had gone up to Samaria and now down south of Jerusalem, simply on a desert road, there in the middle of Judea. Luke's intentionality to include this story here becomes potent as you read the book of Acts because the shepherd who leaves the 99 to go find the one, clearly that is the heartbeat of God who has a divine appointment for Philip with one on a desert road to nowhere. Philip, all through this account, is incredibly sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Remember where we were last week, right? That that we are called to continually abide in the Spirit of the Lord. That volume is all the way up for Philip. And he responds with immediate obedience and humility, leaving every pastor's dream a revival. For what? For one lost sheep. Now, who Philip finds on that desert road is utterly fascinating. We're not given a personal name. Instead, we are simply told that he is an Ethiopian eunuch. Now, this is the ancient kingdom of Nubia or Cush in present-day Sudan. And he is a long way from home. Most commentators will tell you that he is probably a Gentile. 
But that's not necessarily the case, as many Jews have been scattered by exile, and they return, if possible, for festivals. He is a eunuch, meaning he is a castrated male and serves in the court of the Ethiopian queen. Eunuchs were often used in high-profile positions around royalty because there is no threat of impropriety. Often, intellectual slaves were made eunuchs specifically for this purpose. Now, the Ethiopian eunuch here has been traveling for more than a thousand miles. He has an entourage, and he is actually very wealthy based on multiple accounts. One, he's traveling in a chariot, okay? That's a pretty wealthy thing, but also he has his own personal copy of an Isaiah scroll. Very, very, that is a very wealthy item that he has. Luke intends for us to see him as a eunuch. And all that entails in regards to Old Testament worship. In fact, look at the text because the title, the eunuch, is used in verse 34, 36, 38 and 39. One time he's called Ethiopian, and five times he's called a eunuch. See, the idea of castrating males is a foreign concept outside of Israel. In Deuteronomy 23, verse 1, and Leviticus 21, verse 20, states that the eunuch is defective, excluded from temple worship, unable to to participate in sacrificial offerings. Leviticus 21, 17, no man who has a defect shall approach to offer God an offering. You can't draw near. In fact, Isaiah 39, 7 warned that Israel's sons would be carried off into exile and made eunuchs in the kingdom of Babylon. Consider this man's journey. He's been longing for the one true God in a foreign land. So much so that he's willing to invest time and energy and money to go on a very long, a once in a lifetime pilgrimage to Jerusalem, to the temple. And he would stay there for a pretty decent amount of time and observe and watch the major festivals. When he arrives, it is bittersweet. He's a very noticed guest in Jerusalem. Being such a high servant of the Ethiopian queen, he has a longing to learn about the festivals and the priesthood and the sacrifices, all of those point him to the one true God. And he's drawn to that. He he has this yearning in his heart. But he is repeatedly informed that he is defective. On the outside looking in. If he is Jewish, because he is a eunuch, he is not allowed inside any of the temple courtyards. But he must remain outside with the Gentiles. And even if he wanted to become a proselytite, let's say he was a Gentile convert, he has been told that he could never be a full convert. He is deformed, flawed, inadequate. But, but I didn't have a choice in the matter. This was done to me at a young age. It doesn't matter. God's word is clear that his holiness will not allow the imperfect to draw near. Now, don't for a second think that the Jews are just being mean about this, being non-inclusive. These are God's commands, his standard of holiness and perfection. Any Levite priest, okay, who had a defect, could not enter the temple, could not even go near to the altar 
Separate the holy from the common, the clean from the unclean. You see, right here, we are actually at a crossroads in our theology. Most of us are probably a little uncomfortable at the moment. And we need to think sharply about this because the the category right here is those that have been affected by the fall. They have been singled out as separated from drawing near to a holy God. They cannot participate in the same way in Mosaic temple worship. And largely, this is out of their control. Defective, deformed, flawed, imperfect. The lame, the blind, the dwarfed. Those of illegitimate birth. Leviticus 21 refers to eunuchs by accident, those who become a eunuch by an accident, those in Deuteronomy uh, 23, those by surgery. Now, cultures varied here. While there would have been some who would have chosen the procedure, most eunuchs were slaves and were castrated at a prepubescent age. Forever deficient. My niece was retarded in her development at an early age because of severe epilepsy. If she was a Jewish woman, she would never be allowed inside the temple courtyard with the rest of the women. Imagine your son is born with a defect and will never be able to offer an offering for his family. See, this category is meant to teach us about the holiness of God, that only the perfect can enter into his presence and cause a God-fearing man or woman to sympathize with the outcast and to long for a better day. You know, when Jesus came as the expressed heart of God, in his ministry, he sought out this group. He healed the lame and diseased. He gave sight to the blind. He sought the illegitimate. He is known as a friend of sinners. The only passage in the Old Testament that gives you even a glimmer of hope for the eunuch is in Isaiah 56, verses 3 through 5. It spoke of a day that after the suffering servant came, there were a promise, this glimmer of hope to the eunuch. Listen to what it says. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Let, nor let the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. Look at verse five. To them, this is after the servant, the suffering servant comes. To them, I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Notice, within my walls, an everlasting name to those who have no descendants. And wouldn't you know it, that when the Ethiopian eunuch is leaving Jerusalem, and is beginning to make the journey back home. Wouldn't you know it? He is reading Isaiah 53. The passage, the passage about the suffering servant who will usher in all of these promises. And as was customary in the ancient uh, world, he is reading out loud as he goes. And Philip, led by the Spirit, has the courage to approach 
the entourage, and speak directly to the high official. Do you understand what you are reading? How can I unless someone guides me? What a statement. If you were in Philip's shoes, could you explain Jesus to him? You see, the standard is amazing that anybody, anywhere, can share and lead another to Jesus. And yet so few can actually do so. That admonishment is for you, beloved, to roll up your sleeves and get trained. Okay, Chad, last Saturday had an incredible training so that you can, can talk and lead another to Jesus. So Philip climbs up in his chariot and begins to explain. Look at verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and, be and beginning from the scriptures, he preached Jesus to him. Now the scripture passage of Isaiah 53 is absolutely magnificent. Okay? It quickly became uh, one of the most well-known passages to the early church. The Jews had long expected that the Messiah would be saving, would be the conquering king, that he would be victorious in triumph. But they had no expectation of his suffering. So they didn't know what to do with the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, who is despised, who is forsaken, who is pierced for our transgressions, who is crushed for our iniquities. But the early church knew what to do with it, right? They knew that Jesus' victory was in his sacrificial death for our sins. In John's gospel, this is when Jesus is high and lifted up on the cross that God was pleased to crush his son so that we might have life on the other side. This chapter that the Ethiopian eunuch is reading points so clearly to Jesus. But guys, get this, it goes even deeper than that. It goes down to the very words that the, that the eunuch is reading and how they are specifically for him and his life situation because he is reading, and the two verses that are quoted there are Isaiah 53, verses seven and eight. That's Acts chapter eight, verse 32 and 33. All right, and it says, all right, this is what he was reading. That's Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. Now think of everything we've set up this morning in terms of the, of the eunuch being an outcast, being defective, being on the outside looking in. And listen to this. And he was led as a sheep to slaughter. And as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation... He was deprived of justice. And who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. You see here, Jesus, the perfect one, has taken on the imperfections of sin and is silent as a lamb before the slaughter. He is oppressed. He is deprived of justice. And all he receives is humiliation. And he too, like the eunuch, appears to have no descendants and no hope because his life has been taken from him. Can you see how magnificent this is for the eunuch? How perfect it is? And Philip leans over and says to him, friend, Jesus took upon himself all of our sins and all of our deficiencies and all of our imperfections that keep us from a holy God. His life was taken from him, but he rose in victory. 
And he now reigns, sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And in him, you, even you, can have eternal life and draw near to God. No longer a defect, no longer tainted, no longer deformed. You mean in Jesus' blood, even I can come into the full presence of God? Yes. Yes. And right there in the chariot, along a desert road with, with Philip by his side, the Ethiopian eunuch was born again. You see, the application is clear, beloved. Everyone from everywhere, all sins, all defects, all piercings and mutilations, come one, come all to Jesus. Now think about how beautiful and magnificent this is, right? Right after the Samaritans, okay, those false worshiping half-breeds, they get the Holy Spirit. And now here in God's sovereign act, his hand picking up one to go along a, a, a desert road and preach to it the defected eunuch. Don't you see how God is deliberately trying to show us the full extent of the gospel? It's magnificent. Come one, come all, everyone, everywhere, come. Find your wholeness in King Jesus. Now maybe they spent hours in that chariot as they went along. Maybe Philip taught him about obedience to baptism as Peter does in Acts 2. Or maybe at this point he, he knew enough that he needed to be identified with Jesus. But he looks out and he sees a body of water and he asks the question, why not right here, right now? As his first act of obedience, he knew he needed to be identified with Jesus. Let me pause and ask you, have you been identified in believer's baptism? Because you know you need to be identified with Jesus. Verse 38, and he ordered the chariot to be stopped. And they both went down into the water. Philip, as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now catch this. This is magnificent. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And then suddenly the, the, the eunuch no longer saw him, but he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotas. And as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. So look back at that map. I think that's the next slide. Maybe it's not, sorry. And there is Philip just continuing and, and journeying through all through Samaria until he gets to Caesarea. Caesarea is where we will find Philip 20 years later in Acts 21. And there he has four prophetess daughters. There he's called Philip the Evangelist. Now how's that for an incredible title for a humble servant who's willing to be moved like, like God's chess piece anywhere on the board wherever the Lord sees fit. And, and Philip is bold enough to be a witness to anyone that God brings in his path. All those chance meetings throughout each and every day for those sensitive to the Spirit 
and bold enough to step out in faith and speak. A few years back, I was, I was on a plane from Dallas to Lubbock. I had preached a disciple now that weekend in Dallas, and it's a short plane ride, 45 minutes, and my only hope was to uh, curl up in my seat, put my headphones in, listen to some music and snooze. Well, I, I sat next to a freshman at uh, Texas Tech University. Her name was Lauren. And after some promptings and the conversation, it became obvious that I wasn't getting any snoozing done on this flight. Instead, in that short 45-minute flight, Lauren gave her heart and her life to Jesus Christ. and was able to connect her with some churches in Lubbock. A divine moment. Just a couple weeks ago, when the executive pastoral team, we, we were on a flight together. I got to book the seats, and there, there were five of us, and so I, I booked uh, an aisle seat, or, uh, a window seat, and an aisle seat, and an aisle seat, and a window seat, and left those middle ones, and then, and then another window seat behind, and left those, those middle ones open in hopes that like no one would fill those, and then we would get all the extra room. And Well, at the very end of the, you know, you're hopeful as everyone's coming in, please don't sit here, please don't sit here. And, At the, at the very end, as, as you, you know, you, you're thinking, we're doing so well. I'm just going to get to stretch out. Uh, a woman with her two-year-old son came, and <laughs> they were, they were going to be split. Uh, so Gary, in kindness, moved over to the middle seat in here. I'm sitting next to a woman and her young two-year-old son. She actually doesn't speak a lick of English, not a lick not even one word. And I know about seven words from high school Spanish. But as it turns out, as the flight went on and uh, her little son climbed up in my lap to look out the window, we developed a, a bond and a friendship. And it, it turns out that she's a Venezuelan refugee who'd been traveling for the last four months walking the majority of that trip is here in the United States for asylum to start a new life. And she had received aid from churches along the way. Her testimony was that the Lord had providentially provided for her stop after stop after stop. And she was, she was flying to Denver with no one that she knew there, just knew that there was a Venezuelan community that was there in hopes of starting a new life. And we found all that out through Chad. I didn't know any of that because I didn't know any Spanish. But as we walk through the, the airport, we water some food and gave her what little cash we had and prayed over her and followed up over the next several days and connected her with a good church there in the Denver area. A divine appointment. You know, they aren't always this dramatic and they don't have to be on an airplane. The question is, is, are you willing to be a witness? Even pray for someone. The story goes that one day D.L. Moody was, was teaching and a man stood up and claimed that he had spent five years on Mount Transfiguration. The quick-witted Moody replied, how many souls have you won to Christ? Well, I don't know. Well, have you won any? Moody persisted. Well, well, I don't know that I have. Well, then sit down. <laughs> For when men get so high that they cannot reach down to save others, something is wrong. Beloved, may we, may we never become too spiritual for people. 
ordinary people, flawed, imperfect, deficient people whom Jesus loves and died to save. If you would, would you take your Lord's Supper elements and begin to prepare them? Prepare the bread first. Again, this is for all born again, baptized believers. We will take this together. As you think about Christ's broken body, we've heard from this morning's passage. May we all remember our inadequacies. There is none righteous, no, not one. But he who was perfect went outside the camp because he had become my curse of sin and because he had taken on all of my imperfections. And all of that was placed upon him and nailed to the cross. So I'll give you a brief moment to confess those imperfections to the Lord, to take serious and to ponder his sacrifice for you. And then we will take this together. King Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. This morning, we again remember and confess and lay our sins at the foot of the cross. Cleanse us again. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body. Now, as you prepare the cup, I want you to remember this is good news. Good news. That is that Jesus pursued you and found you and did all the work for you. That he is the lifter of your head so that you would realize and find delight in him. And this good news must be told. It must be told. So I want you to pause and contemplate. Not only is the good news for you, and, and we leave here with the assurance of all that Jesus has done. But would you confess to the Lord your need to tell others. I'll give you a few moments.
And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Would you pray with me? Our heavenly father, King Jesus, we love you and we thank you. Just this passage and the way it stirs our mind and our attention to your detail for the one. And knowing that each of us has a story from eternity past that you knew us and that you called us and that you, you shaped us through events and circumstances and, and lifted our head and opened our eyes so that we would see you, so that we would know you, so that we would have our delight in you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We can, we can never repay, nor do you require us to repay. But we overflow with praise and gratitude. And we say we trust you and we love you. And we surrender our lives to you in worship to you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen.